Good evening, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to um, come here in Brick Lane Circle Forum and introduce um, this talk today, which is going to be about Greek influence on Natya Shastra. That is Indian theater, but with reference to certain developments in Bengal as well. We're very fortunate to have Shohini Roy Chaudhary here today, who is the director of uh, Shohini Moksha, a dance, a multinational, multicultural dance troupe that has certainly um, gone around the world, picking up several awards for various kinds of performances, of which I think one of her recent as well as in the past uh, focus has been to look at how to connect civilizational values across the world. So today I think Shohini wants to talk exactly about Greek influences on Indian theatre, uh, a field that is very, very under-researched, I, th I think, um, even though we hear a lot about uh, Greek writings and Greek influences of authors and writers on Indian literature, to look at specifically on theatre and theatre forms and theatre actions is not something uh, we've heard in the past. And it's, it's also something that comes from her own perspective as a performer, and I think that makes a lot of difference to read and understand theatre from the point of view of a performer who experiments with theatre as well. So I want to briefly introduce to Shohini Moksha and uh, what it actually does, giving a little bit of background of her own training and um, her upbringing. I mean, she is the daughter of Pandit uh, Subrato Roy Chaudhary, who has recently passed away, the famous sitar player and an illustrious musician himself. But she also took up training in Indian classical dancing from the age of eight, trained under Tangamani Kutti and Guru Venkit, who are obviously very respected Bharat Natyam and Mohini Natyam gurus. Uh, there is some specific style, as you can see, that she has worked on the Tanjore style, but with Shohini, it has always been about interpretation of mythology and building in that that kind of interpretation into the aesthetics of dance in, in various recent innovative ways. So there, there is a lot of work she's done on self-choreographed uh, thematic dance dramas and she is uh, known for some very interesting performances that relate to deities and power of deities which she's going to present in Bloomsbury Festival that is just coming up as well. I just wanted to focus a bit on multiculturalism that shows a little bit about her truth. And um, here I think you can see that there, there's a mixture of uh, troop members who have come from Spain, India, Jamaica, France, Iraq and Bulgaria. But interestingly enough, they are not just students from different parts of the world, but they also contribute quite a lot to the various ideas that um, are part of her choreographed productions. So it's also about the various clothing and the various other sort of um, accessories that are used in her performances that makes a slightly different connections that are not just geographical connections but also sociocultural connections that um, the, the troupe kind of brings on. And I move to the themed productions that she does. And you can look at the themes that really talk a little bit about 
um, dreams and, and kind of surreal, supernatural ideas in, in her work, which is, you know, Dancing with Shiva is one that she's done. I think the Ganga is also a very recent um, production that looks at journey of the river, but interpreting the rhythms of the journey of the river through dance. So it's also kind of varying slightly about the various topics that are not just within one country, but then connecting rivers to different countries is something that is very much coming up um, in the India-UK year of culture, where the Thames and the Ganges connections are being drawn by artists like, um, uh, <coughs> by, by various artists. And recently we had the Thames Walk, which is connecting um, painters and artists who, um, who can then look at the, the way the river has shaped uh, art and culture. So there's a lot of um, experiments around Ganga, for instance. Um, there's also other things she does, and you can look at Ulysses, for instance. So there's a lot of focus on epics and looking at legends and how legends and epics can be interpreted in different ways. So she has worked on a Greek uh, legends, the Ulysses, for instance, and then tried to use that as a base to experiment with um, Indian theatre as well. Um, <clears throat> there's various concerts and workshops that Shohini has done, and there's a very illustrious list that one can go into her site to see the various international concerts and and performances across the world, um, which includes, you know, from Russia to Germany to, to Paris. I mean, I, I've known Shoini just cross various boundaries with diplomatic as well as civic festivals, and she works across the board as well. The Shoini and children is another interesting area because I think she finds inspiration with children in a different way. She's, she's an extremely... Um, creative person around children, just introducing them to something like Maya's dreams and, and relating uh, children's movements and scripts with, with some kind of, um, you know, very, very interesting participative workshops that she devises. So one thing about her work is, is a lot of interactions and interactive workshops and dance, and her dance demonstrations are just as interactive. Things that she will be showing very recently in SOAS um, on the 19th and the 20th. We have two sessions, 1.30 to 3.30. For two hours she will be demonstrating the moves and the emotions and working on the physicality of dance, which also can include children. So that's all very family friendly if people are interested to join as well. Um, just wanted to very quickly look at the various performances, if you wanted to just have a brief look of the kind of things. interesting selection of gallery here where <coughs> Shoini's um, group images are particularly interesting again there's a whole and we <laughs> she's very I think it was a premiere with Danny Boyle yeah, for Danny Slumdog Millionaire yes. <coughs> troupe and brought together a brilliant performance so you know you can and she's also uh, very much into Bollywood and lots of Bollywood actors she has trained and worked with. I think one is something we all Rithik like, Roshan. is Rithik Roshan's uh, being trained to learn how to do Krishna. So you know, she, she kind of brings on the cinematic element in her theatre and experiments with screen and you know, all that as well. So it's also about moves and images and I think she uses a lot of interesting images to, to project her performance. So that, that makes it quite interesting as well. So there's lots of yoga at Boston. She's probably done, she's been doing yoga from the age of five as well as, as, well as uh, dance. I've always known her um, that she's into that and that also brings some features into her dancing. 
<clears throat> and I think this is again uh, probably a production in Spain. I can't really see. <coughs> yes. This, this was in Spain. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Obviously, you've seen it already. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a very interesting site to go into and look at uh, how um, she's grown in terms of her ideas and developed her skills with various different types of productions, but mainly experimenting and making it all very interactive with different mediums, cinema, theatre, all kind of mixing in some kind of um, a very strong interactive performance. Um, press and publicity, of course, is, is another matter. She's been covered in press quite a lot. And, um, <clears throat> that uh, is all part of a lot of uh, diplomatic uh, exchanges. Uh, she's represented India in different ways, and perhaps you can tell a little bit about her awards in this country. I mean, the list just goes on. So, without <laughs> going on a little bit more, I would really like to invite Shogini to the forum and start the talk on connecting. Civilizations. Do you want to? You have. Sitting there. Yeah. Do you want to do the slide if you don't mind? I can do that. I can do that. It's not. She a... can do the. Okay. Uh, what about you have to append drive? Yeah, that's it. That's okay. Need to go away. UK talk. Yeah, that's it. UK talks. You have to. What I was thinking. If you sit here and just do the slide. Okay. Yeah. I think. So where where are the slides? Is it here? Yeah, it's in the pen drive there. Mm. So, it is. Oh, yeah. so it's one after the other. Mm. And if you're there, then. Should you sit down? Yeah, you talk. Yeah. Okay. Should I start? I would like to thank you. Yeah. 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 This will all be edited anyway. So. Hmm. Okay. Can I start? Yeah. I would like to thank Dr. Sanjukta Ghosh for her visionary project of trying to bring the world a little closer together. Because at the end of the day, it's humanism at large and nothing better than culture to create that kind of empathy and bring the world a little closer together. Thank you, Dr. Sanjukta Ghosh, and I'm very happy and honored to be speaking at this forum, which is again like the Ganges, a fusion, a melting pot of cultures, of races, of civilizations. And that's, that's where our journey begins and ends, and that's what we should all be aware of in this journey to keep it simple, peaceful, and happy. My topic today is connecting civilizations. And I would like to speak about the Natya Shastra, our most ancient text on theater, Natya, and Aristotle's influence over it. The Natya Sutra it comes from the Greeks. Theater is a word which comes from the Greeks. It means the seeing place where people meet, they live, and they discover and discuss the truth about life and society. It's all about communication. That's vital. And theater, as always, is immediate, organic, and alive. The world's a stage, as you all know. We need to see how the stage has evolved by taking lessons from life. There are primarily two theatres practiced the world over, Aristotelian and Indian. Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra, which was composed in the forests, where he was all by himself without human cacophony getting into it, 
and Aristotle's poetic should not be seen in different lights, should not be dealt with as Eastern and Western productions only. We need to understand them within the framework of Indian European culture and the art of sacred theater or, or hieropraxis. When the Natya Shastra was composed in 200 BC, Alexander was in India with all his troops. His retinue, his retinue consisted of a lot of Greek actors who excelled in tragedy to be able to provide entertainment to his soldiers. Herman Reich's theory of Greso Roman pantomime as a source of Natya also shows the influence of Plautus and Terence in the development of Natya in the way we know it today. Aristotle's famous law of dramatic unity of time, place and action is very much present in the Natya Shastra in Kalidasa's Abhinaya Shakuntalam, which was one of those initial Sanskrit theatres which was written at that time. And it had music along with theatre. Bhasa's Swapna Vasavdatta was based on Euripides' play Alcestis. Again, artistic goal in Greek tragedy was catharsis, which could be compared with rasa in Natya, purging or complete empathy. It doesn't completely define rasa, but catharsis could well be a part of rasa. The prologue in Greek tragedy corresponds to the function of prastavana in Natya. The proagon was a preliminary ceremony where the poets appeared before the public and with the actors, with the choruses and the actors presented the introduction to the plays. In Natya, the prastavana was a part of the text of the drama, usually based on epic literature. One can compare Rhesus, the prose part of tragedy, with the prose part of Natya. Use of language and dialect in a tragedy. For example, Attic was used for the dialogue, Doric and Aeolic in the lyrical parts. In Natya, similarly, San Sanskrit and Prakrit was used very often. The role of the Vidusaka in the Natya can be compared with the humorous elements of satire in the Greek plays at that time. There was also great similarity in structure. The choral odes between the episodes in Greek tragedy can be compared to the divisions of the avasthas and the sandhyangas of Natya. The concept of acting, the concept of acting Mimesis in Greek tragedy can be very com favorably compared to the Anukarana, which means copying, in Natya. The messenger scenes in the Greek tragedies often show a pravesaka in Natya and correspond to each other in their functions of sometimes giving some kind of comic relief, but being present and in similar characteristics. In the 1970s, the French archaeologist Paul Bernard excavated a Greek amphitheater in Al Khanum in Afghanistan, and that was a very important center for Indo-Gracio art. It was a Hellenistic Bactrian center, and it was probably a place where they practiced theater for the entertainment of troops in between battle. This was also a place where Gandhara art flourished, the Hellenistic uh, Indo art, where Buddha or Shiva was often kind of uh, projected with the features, with Greek features of Zeus. And you had the divine figures of Indian art, Indian mythology, 
projected in that uh, Hellenistic Greek god style. So that shows a direct connect between the two and as art, poetry, theatre all connected on some basis, it was a proper fusion of humanity that had happened. It was the epics Ramayana and Mahabharata, it was at this juncture that Indian classical theatre assumed the shape of Natya, turning from just retelling divine tales and dealing with mythology. And at this turning po point, from ritualistic theatre to dramatic classical theatre, we can also see how Mahabharata can be completely analysed part by part as in the Aristotelian tragic mode. It fits into every groove of the Aristotelian tragedy, the Mahabharata. Abhinaya was derived, as you saw, from Mimesis and Anukarana. Both classical and Greek theatre traditions strove for sacred action, hieropraxis. They both promulgated worship, philosophical understanding and theatrical representation at the same time. They pleased both the gods and the men and used semiotize gestures, music, dance, dialogue to create a highly ornate theatrical reality. Both promoted social and moral values among people. In Greek theatre, they achieved this by acquainting people with the Olympian gods. In Indian theatre, they promoted Vedic values with the idea of making life better. So in a sense, both were theatres of avatar or reincarnation. Also, neither had puritanical views on art. All arts were instruments for higher ecstatic experience. The puritanical values kept, crept in into the Natya for sure after Victorian England also did similar things. And that was a period of time where in dance, Shringara Rasa, which, which was of love and lust, immediately changed to a devotional Rasa, where all that love and longing was expressed towards one's God or towards dream. It was no longer lifelike between two lovers. So that is what Victorian England probably taught us. Hmm, of course. <laughs> Unlike Greek drama, classical Indian theatre used performances as a close encounter between the audience. Indian theatre was secular, whereas Greeks were entirely subsumed by the metaphysical and contemporary political concerns. Greek theatre was entirely ritualistic, done two or three times a year on very special occasions. Whereas Indian theatre was more populist and it projected and could be enacted as an everyday life feature. Another interesting distinction was, and similarity one could say, was the use of language. Indian theatre was multilingual, using Sanskrit and non-Sanskrit dialects. But at this time, Greek theatre was only in literary Greek and was not known to use prose at all. It was meant for the higher strata. Greek theatre came to an end roughly in the second century AD with the advent of Christianity. The worship of Olympian gods was meant to be forgotten. Post-Renaissance drama, European drama, which is what Western theatre essentially is, was secular in content and projected realist reality. The primary goal of this European theatre was social reformation, culminating the works of writers with a clearly leftist leaning, such as Dryden, Dryden Ibsen and Shaw. Similarly, in India, around the 11th century AD, with the coming of Islam, 
classical Indian drama ceased to be in the urban theatre. It was banished to the countryside. Even then, the worship of deities was not permitted. And it remained there until the arrival of the British who brought back theatre to the cities. But their tradition was Victorian in spirit and in technique. This coupled with the national struggle for independence gave birth to socio-political version of theatre with very little concern for the metaphysical. Rural theatre was still following the ancient traditions of performance with all its glory and colour and drama as we know it now. Music, dance, costumes, poetics, myths, incarnation, devotion and also had its uh, very profound, very deep, simplified questions of, about life. Rasa and catharsis were related to each other. Rasa may not be completely defined by catharsis, but catharsis can very well be one of the arms of Rasa. Yeah, rasa, uh, when an actor or a dancer goes on stage, rasa, my interpretation of rasa is empathy. For example, if I'm doing something to show anger, the audience also feels that anger. I'm not saying anything. So it's just with the theatrics, the ambience is created. Rasa is what happens when the actor does what he's supposed to very well and the audience Audience is not a simple normal audience. The audience is known as a rasika, an intellectual audience who can connect to what's happening, also react to what the actor is doing. And the ambience created by the actor, the reactive audience is rasa. It's the ambience created from empathy. And the Sanskrit word or is Indian word? It's an Indian word, rasa. Rasa as in Navarasa, the nine Greeks sometimes uh, interpret it as the muses. For example, you have the Melpomenae and uh, uh, Talia, which is one is melancholy, one is happiness. But there's more to an Indian Rasa than just that simplified uh, version. So Rasa is the ambience created. You have the nine Rasas. One is the sadness, one is anger, one is the feeling of empowerment, one is uh, repulsion. So there are nine rasas which are created by good acting and good absorption. And rasa is what is created. It would empathy would be the closest word to it. Rasa means feeling. Rasa is it's not feeling. It's what is created because feeling is what we feel. Yes, but the actor does not feel it. The actor is showing it. The audience feels it. So that duality of the actor pro expressing it and the audience feeling it and creating, for example, when you go for a movie and, uh, for example, uh, Norman Bates, and you hear that music without anything happening, you imagine something terrible is about to happen, you almost cringe that, okay, somebody's going to get killed or maimed or shot or something. So that feeling that you've got in anticipation is what is about to come, that feeling of fear and anticipation that is the feeling, that is rasa created by these various organs. It's basically that particular somber moment. That moment which is created, yeah, and it's giving you, I mean, I, if it's thriller, it's just anticipation, you know, holding that bated breath, holding your breath, okay, who's going to get killed? That, that feeling that has been created by excellent acting, music. Is this in Bangla we call Rosh? Rosh, Rosh Obod, to a certain extent, yes. Uh -huh. Because uh, I'm learning Indonesian language. Mm -hmm. and rasa means feeling. So mm -hmm. And Indonesia has a lot of Sanskrit. In uh -huh. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking whether. Hmm. Rasa is more than feeling. You know, feeling is what I feel. I mean, suppose somebody misbehaves with me, I'm angry. So this rasa, but rasa for rasa, it is not just the protagonist, it is the music. It is your own excess baggage also what you have in your head from before and a music also you know certain notes of the violin will make you feel a little more sad 
where certain notes will make you happier guitar. So music is also contributing in a big way to the rasa being created. Rasa is being created by the ambience. Catharsis is a kind of with the purging of a feeling. It's kind of release. So catharsis could be one small part of rasa, but rasa is not exactly catharsis. So which idea is ancient? Is the rasa? Rasa, yeah, ancient yeah. Than... Uh, ancient, we don't know because history, as we know, was written written after a long time, and and uh, it was interpreted and misinterpreted by the people in power. So we would like to think we influenced the Greeks. The Greeks would like to think there's white supremacy, and they've influenced us. And I think part of the talk is also to see, you know, what does actually influence mean here? Huh. You know, whether it's an external influence on something, mm. or is it a mutually uh, sort of conjoining process? Mm. Because just as Indian civilization is old and mm -hmm. has its theatrical traditions, you kind of think because the Greeks invaded, they brought the mm. ideas in. I think that's going to evolve through the presentation and we can see where the differences are and how, how we can then take some of the discussions. And when the Natya Shastra was being written, Alexander was actually in India at that time. You know, when the Natya Shastra was written in, its, in the form that we know, it was not written, it was dictated. Written when we don't know. It was only when printing came into being that we have actual manuscripts. It was all hand-me-down, it was spoken to one another. So, storytelling, it, nothing was ever 100% authentic. You can't say today that this is 12th century authentic. It was what was told to the 12th century and then, then what came down in the 13th century. And once it got tabulated, you would know still. So, there are some gray areas everywhere. And there's a misplaced notion always that Greek theater was, tra that tragedy is something with an unhappy ending, but it was not so. Greek plays were typically written in trilogies and it was the first part that ended in death or uh, defeat, ended in decline. And the second part and the third part, there was always reconciliation and progressed towards a more peaceful, a more uh, happier conclusion. However, European dramatists like uh, Marlowe, Shakespeare and Dryden modeled their plays only after the first part of the Greek, Greek trilogy and therefore the tradition of tragedy grew in Europe and it was kept like that Greek tragedy but actually Greek tragedies were not meant, Greek trilogies were not meant to be sad or tragic. It was how it was popularized and how it was used by the Western European writers. So do you, do you have, um, are you able to trace Indian influence on Greek after Alexander's visit? I find though the Mahabharata was written much before mm -hmm. Aristotle was written much, written, uh, but you see before or after I wouldn't kind of uh, trace so much but the similarity in thought because the Mahabharata can be analyzed absolutely if, if Greek tragedy was to have, have a role model the Mahabharata would fit in perfectly though it was written so much longer before Aristotle almost 500 years I think but it fits perfectly Mahabharata can be treated as a Greek tragedy you know like a perfect example absolutely page by page and with every, every phase of a tragedy, from the hubris to the catharsis, all of it. So I wouldn't know who influenced whom or what can be traced back, but definitely the minds are thinking alike. You know, so maybe whether Mahabharata influenced Aristotle, well, I think we can move on with that kind of discussion because I think I'll have something to contribute to that in terms of how external influences are being written mm -hmm. in history. Mm -hmm. And there is, uh, you know, there is a tendency to kind of read influences uh, from the top to the below, exactly. from the outside mm -hmm. to the inside. And mm -hmm. those kind of theories don't actually neatly fit. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the reasons why we have talks like that, mm -hmm. where there is a certain presentation of Greek tragedy and its mm -hmm. forms and how we imbibe those through various means, textbooks, 
you know, understanding through schools, mm -hmm. you know, institutions that prop those ideas. And then if you do, if you actually look at performances, if you actually engage with performances, then you can see that things are not quite the same, they're different. And that's why a performer would be able to disentangle those kind of influences and, and bring on the discussion of it. Mm. More absolutely, no, no, absolutely. And let's move to the next mm. bit of Rasa and mm -hmm. Kathasa. And rasa and catharsis are not contradictory because it's a kind of purification that is necessary for a rasa to begin. The idea of catharsis also, like rasa, is purification. And Aristotle did not really deem catharsis as the primary you know, theme or the primary aim of drama. He talks about a special pleasure the tragedy is able to give us. And so the bottom line is the tragedy also is designed to give some kind of pleasure, some kind of release, some kind of relief. The Mahabharata can be related to tragedy in some ways. As I said, according to Hermann Oldenburg, the original epic once carried uh, an immense tragic force. It was common in Sanskrit drama at that time to keep on adopting episodes from the Mahabharata into the dramatic form because it lent itself beautifully to Natya. In the Natya Shastra, Bharat Muni identified se several rasas, the pity, anger, disgust, terror, as the emotional responses of audience for Sanskrit drama of ancient India. The text also suggests the notion of musical modes or jatis, which are the origin of the notion of modern melodic structure called raga, on which uh, the entire classical music of India is based on, on the raga structure. And they say that the raga notes can evoke a particular rasa. For example, the emotions emphasized are directly related to the frets on the sitar or the sarod and with the notes. The compositions emphasizing the notes Gandhara or Rishav are said to provoke sadness or the heroism, the Veera Rasa. For example, uh, if you are not familiar with the Raga concept, you hear the wail of the Shehnai. And it's just a melancholic uh, kind of strain. But it's the notes are meant to put in a melody that, that makes you feel a bit sad. The Navarasa and the Nine Muses. The nine principal ra rasas of uh, Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra. First is Shringar. Shringar is love, attractiveness, spring, youth, Anything related with happiness, naturalness, nature, regeneration. The presiding deity is Vishnu. Vishnu in mythology is the one who sustains nature in all its beauty. The second rasa is Hasyam or Sataya. Laughter, mirth. The presiding deity is Ganesha. You all know Ganesha, the elephant-headed god. Hasyam. The third is Rodram, fury. Rodram is just anger when you think about the Shiva Tandav, you know, putting a world weary and damaged to end and creating a new beginning. That's Rodram. The presiding deity is Rodra or Shiva and the principal colors are orange and red. Karunyam, again, is compassion or tragedy. The presiding de uh, deity is Yama, the god of death, or the god of uh, karma, as he said, not death if you don't want to be negative. Vibhatsam, disgust, aversion, also the presiding deity is Shiva. Bhayanakam, horror and terror, the presiding deity is Kala. I just want to uh, hmm. Mm -hmm. To see your faces and your expressions is quite interesting. 
mm. because I just wanted to also point out that you kind of experiment with all mm -hmm. these various emotions and you almost kind of stand possibly in front of a mirror and perfect that. And she brings on that kind of stage feature into the dance. So all her dances would also have those kind of emotions and emphasis on those features and facial expressions. She kind of worked on it as well, which mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. um, makes it a bit more distinctive as a style that makes the brand showing the emotion as well. So yeah, I just wanted to say that a bit. And all the others that you're going to talk of next is the heroic mood. Huh. Viram is the heroic mood. The presiding deity is Indra. In uh, Indian mythology, Indra is the king of the gods. We have Adbhutam, wonder, amazement. You know, the little, little things in life that just make you come alive. And the presiding deity is Brahma, because Brahma, the four-headed god, is believed in Indian mythology to have created the world. So it's the wonder and amazement of creativity. Shantam, the last rasa, is peace and tranquility. Presiding deity is Vishnu again, the Shanta or Vishnu, who kind of uh, retains, sustains, and keeps harmony. And you have in Greek muses, Euter, with the lyric, poetry, and the Greek flute, could kind of correspond to Shringar. Can we go back to those lights? Do you see those? Sure. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Form or is there it's it's kind of changes. changes yeah it's a bit more fluid it's not exact because uh, shringar love harmony spring new life hope dream it covers a whole canvas of positivity so it could be euterp the lyric poetry greek flute it could be calliope epic poetry Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. I think this is where we started. Or? Oh, no, it's three. Yeah, no, yeah. It's and you have Talia, comedy and pastoral poetry. Comic mask. Talia could be a bit of, uh, you know. It, I think she wants to go back to this page. And ah, okay. To Just to see the correlation. Yeah. Correlation could be Hasyam. And Tapishor is more about dance, which is kind of divides between Viram. Viram is also about Shiva dancing in mirth to create new life, new world. So Viram could be related to the Tapishur. It's not exact, but more or less Melopomene and Talia are the two broad bases, you know, tragedy and happiness. Is that Viram you're covering? Hmm, hmm. Viram would be Tapishur dance. So all the expressions that we see, all mm -hmm. the dancers in the stage, mm -hmm. uh, all, all should cover this one of this nine. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Or yeah. even more than one at the same time. Yes, and usually. That, that is the most interesting bit of bringing on emotions. I'm sorry, I'm asking you a question now because I'm no, going no. to leave at eight. So no, don't worry, don't worry, answer. absolutely. And it is important, for example, you have your alphabets A to Z, and you just cannot get out of that alphabet structure. Whatever, even whether it's a PhD thesis or whether a four-year-old is writing a poem, you cannot get out of the structure. There can be nothing more. Those are used in various permutations, combinations, and a, a dance's repertoire is like that. You have these nine rasas. So what about the fingers posing on a different Those way? are mudras. Those are mudras again. That is a different chapter, but what we do, Rasa, the Navarasa, Navarasa, the Natya, theatre, is about your body language. It's not just about facial expression, it's your body language also. So it all combines to create Natya or theatre, which invokes the Rasa. So it's basically, Mudra is like the elements, but the purpose is to make Mudra is what we, mudras, uh, mudras are the hand gestures. Navarasa is the nine rasas that we want to create 
that should happen with the right natya. Natya is the theatrical, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ultimate purpose is the rasa, yeah. For a dancer or a person in the theatrics, I mean, if I'm walking in and trying to show that I'm terribly scared, the audience should also hold their breath, you know, and not think that something funny is about to happen, then I failed badly. So, Bharat Muni is the person who wrote the Natya Shastra. He is Muni Bharat, the sage. Bharata, the sage, he wrote the Natya Shastra. He composed and wrote the Natya Shastra, which is like a treatise of theatre in India. Which century person he is? He is second century. Second century. Mm -hmm. And about those, those, those equivalent to Greek things, mm -hmm. who uh, categorized those nine things? Mm -hmm. Greek muses is what we found. We don't know who categorized it really. It's partly it's mythology. It's but it, it is something which has evolved because Aristotle came much later and it was more structured and academic and philosophical what he did. You know, this, is, this was partly developed through mythology. You know, whoever develops uh, uh, theories about Zeus and Athena and Adonis and uh, Hermaphrodite, it, it, was, it evolved like that, like our mythology evolved. There's nobody specific who can be so pointed no out. Bharat Muni person to the Greek. There may have Herodotus. been, maybe we don't know about him. I don't know. I mean, like Herodotus <laughs> and all wrote their history out. But here we don't, we, no, we are not aware of the Bharat Muni kind of person. But it's interesting that he's also writing the Natya Shastra not just to, you know, text. It's mm -hmm. kind of evolving through oral yeah. history and oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, during the time Alexander is also there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you're looking at various fusions mm -hmm. in different ways. Because as you also said, that a lot of it was also in the battlefront. You know, the theatre is also evolving in these various parts of the... Uh, you know, presentations and performances were very much there, I think. I mean, it's another story, perhaps, another research to see how much of the soldiers were influencing um, some of the powers, perhaps, you know, and tragedy mm -hmm. and peace and those kind of ideas um, have evolved, perhaps, from war and invasion, slightly. So, Ashtanaika, are we on this page mm -hmm. now? The Ashtanaika means the eight principal female protagonists and the way they were projected. It's the collective name for the eight types of Naikas classified by the Bharat Muni in his Natya Shastra. And the eight Naikas represent eight states of being, the way they were, which were all dictated by her relationship with the Nayak or the hero. And archetypal states of the romantic heroine, it has been used as a theme for paintings, a lot of paintings, Madhubani and otherwise, uh, base their, uh, th base their uh, subject on the Ashtanaika. How the woman would react if the man is away or when the man surfaces or the man has gone off forever. You know, everything was oriented around that. The temple structures are around mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. of themes. Mm -hmm. If you look at the more romantic temple structures, mm -hmm. I think there's a very interesting work on Konark, for instance, mm. you know, that why is, why do we suddenly see a, a lot of nudity seen mm -hmm. um, on the temples? And there's, there's a lot of controversy about it. And is it all to do with erotica? That's, uh, that's a very interesting take. Um, then one, of, one researcher I know, uh, I forget her name, but she kind of researched and saw that it's actually not related to just eroticism. It's also to do with a more live ritual that was happening around that time where women were changing their clothes and they were doing something as part of a ritual which then gets projected. So there's a lot of live art that is being experimented around this time and perhaps this is, you know, Ashtonaika probably evolved from these kind of living art traditions as well. The Ashtonaikas were the Sadhina Bhartuka, which means the very independent-minded lady. Swadhina Bhartuka was the one having her husband in subjection. <laughs> the myth, man doesn't exist, <laughs> kind of like Santa Claus. It's the woman who's loved by her husband and controls him completely. He's subjugated by her intense love and pleasing qualities. And in the picture you can see he's sitting and adroitly painting her feet, applying her Mahavar. Isn't that something we 
normally see. No, it's normally see or hear about also. It's a, no, it's a myth. I think it was created by some woman's fantasy somewhere. It never really came true. <laughs> Well, I haven't come across any woman who owns such a partner or just, you know, applying a vermilion tilak on her forehead. Then you have the viraha kanthita. Viraha kanthita is one who is distressed by separation and is described by Kesava Dasa, the great poet and writer, is the distressed heroine who is pining for her lover and uh, I think Shakespeare could have, <laughs> could have been talking about it also a lot, like a lot of our Indian authors. It's their favorite kind of heroine, I think, pining and pining for her love and, you know, revolving her life around it. That also, that kind of woman has also become a, a myth, thankfully. <laughs> and uh, who, due to preoccupation, the lover fails to come home and she's depicted waiting for him, sitting or standing on the bed or, you know, out in the pavilion, just waiting that, indefinitely. That also replicates in Bollywood films. Yeah. Yes. You know, yes. yeah. The pavilion is quite an interesting, mm -hmm. you know, by the of the pavilion. Yeah. It's a classic yeah. <laughs> way of looking at, you know, how a heroine would, would react to certain... Yeah. Uh, and and, and you can see where the transitions are. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, now, but that's also become dated. In the last five years, I don't yeah. think they've produced any Bollywood film worth its while where the woman is just waiting. She's just too busy doing her own work to notice the man for that matter. The next is Vasaka Sajja, you know, Virahakanthita waiting expectantly and for her lover to come. And uh, Vasaka Sajja is the one all dressed up for reunion with him and is just waiting next to the bed, all done up when he's coming back from a journey and she's depicted in the bedchamber with lotus leaves and garlands, dressing herself for the perfect union and eager with expectation. Her beauty is compared by Keshav Dasa, who has written about it to, with Rati. Rati is the wife of the god of love, Kama, in Indian mythology and was known for her very, very beautiful face and body. So. Next you have Kalantarita is the one who's separated by a quarrel. She quarrels and the heroine separates from him due to her own jealousy or arrogance. Her lover is usually depicted leaving her apartment disoriented while he too becomes heartsick and repentant. Without him she just can't, simply can't be and depicted refusing the advances of her lover or refusing a wine cup you know from the lover in Geet Govinda Radha, Krishna's consort is often depicted like that as Krishna is with his various gopikas, the various ladies in his life. There's a philosophical aspect, of course, and she's forever waiting and angry and is part of their love game. You have Khandita, the one enraged with her lover and whose lover has promised to spend the night with her but instead comes to her the next morning after spending the night with another woman and she is depicted very offended rebuking her lover for his infidelity. You have the Proshita Bhartuka with the woman whose husband has gone away from her for some business and does not return and she is depicted sit seated mourning surrounded by her maids but refusing to be consoled. And these are the various emotions that you're hmm. talking about. Hmm. That is also the various, uh, the emotions are not so different. The emotions are all of waiting and pining for the man. And it, is, it, it, it was more of a projection of the patrimonial society, how women should be, their body language, their state of mind and body is completely based on the uh, way the man treats her. You know, but um, that's how it, it, it's all in, okay, either she's in love and waiting or she's in love and angry and waiting, he doesn't come or she's in love and a little angrier because he's with another woman and goes on. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in different ways. Yes. These images are very, when were they painted? Really? These are Madhubani paintings generally. They are... Uh, they're still around. They're still around, yeah. Folk art. This is more from folk art because that was influenced by very much by the, the Ashtanaikas. 
Vipralabdha is the one who has been deceived by her lover. Do you want to move on with these slides and kind of sum up of it because they seem to... Uh -huh. ah, okay. Vipralabdha, we have Abhisharika because it helps to understand that a bit. Yeah. So who waited for the lover but who didn't turn up. And the last is Abhisharika, who the one who moves, you know, is gone shamelessly out to look for her lover through rain and through storm and hail and maybe wild beasts and snakes, you know, to add that extra drama. The switch over from this patrimonial society to uh, the one with elements of early feminism was around the 11th century uh, when the mother goddess started being worshipped in structured temples, Durga, what she's been handling. And according, this was around the same time also the first, the Sufi saints, the first woman Sufi saint started writing her poetry. And it was this time that the Ashtanaika became different. It was Mangala, Vijaya, Bhadra, Jayanti, Aparajita, Nandini, Narasimha and Komari, all different aspects of the Mother Goddess Durga. And their Stai Bhava, their state of being had nothing to do with a man. It was about... I think that is partly Sufi influence, it would be quite interesting. Definitely Sufi influence, partly influence of the concept of Ishtar, the Mother Goddess worshipped in Syria, to, Syria. To perform in so as and just kind of bring out these, you know, Iraq, Mesopotamian influences, kind huh. of mingling into how the deity is then portrayed from the 11th century. And interestingly enough, this is also the mm. Muslim period mm -hmm. settling in, uh, and, and the influences are getting a bit more complex, I think, mm -hmm. here as well. For example, Bangala means the one who blesses you with an auspicious moment, brings good to you, brings welfare to you, it has nothing to do with a man. If there's one around, good for her, he'll help achieving what she wants, otherwise she exists by herself and making a difference to the world. Vijaya means somebody who contributes to victory, the victorious one. Aparajita is one who cannot be defeated. Narasinghi is somebody with the spirit and the heart of a lion. A woman. So it was the world had taken a full swing. This is more or less the Nati Shastra and the Aristotelian connection. I'll go on to the theatre of Bengal. I just wanted to very quickly hmm, wrap this bond. up, uh -huh. and I find this very interesting what you said that you know by the 11th century the, the influence of the Sufis are coming in kind of coinciding with a lot of Islamic influence as well. So the, the idea that the deity of the goddess and you know, the fact that it's feminine power is all very puritanical Hinduism, which is something the debates are now growing quite strong, mm -hmm. say, for India. It's interesting to see how this is not actually quite a puritanical image, but it has its influences building around in different ways. So, so if you deconstruct beyond the deity and move into emotions mm -hmm. that comprise the deity, that's when the influences start to, to look a bit more complex than how people would want to construct a, a more kind of self-contained puritanical Hindu image of the goddess Durga, for instance. And that's one of the things that we are going to be doing in the performance, and that is where we're going to look at Durga as an image, not just of an idol, mm. but going beyond that and looking at emotions and layers and the meanings of weapons, the meanings of how things have crept up in literature and art quite differently. I think that's what makes the topic a bit more interesting as well. And I would like to say something off the topic. Sanjukta, the way you've done your Durga deity, I don't know whether it was by design or coincidence, you've just got the mother goddess Durga and the Mahisasura, which I find amazing because in Calcutta, often in the large pujas, you have Madurga and Shiva somewhere around, her husband, and the four children, Ganesha, Kartik, and Saraswati and Lakshmi, which I think is again. Uh, it is something imposed by the patrimonial society that even if the woman is a warrior and she's bringing the world to order, she needs to put her children and her husband also around her for validation. The Soas statue is just Mother Goddess and the Mahisasura, 
which also proves a point. I think, you know, to be successful at work or whatever, when you don't have to carry that tag around with you that these are my children, this is my husband, they do not need to be on your face. You are who you are, the way you are. So that is something I really liked. I said, this is good. But maybe something that you can announce when we start this. And it's been interesting to... Yeah, it was interesting to see that. Interesting to see that, of course, she's a mother and she's a great homemaker. But you don't need to bring it to the forefront to give her validation, just like a man may be a great father and a great cook, but you're not bringing him there with his MBA degree. You know, so similar. I think that's a very important aspect of Durga, and I saw it in SOAS. Perhaps engage with. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you Okay. Thank you for coming. Let's talk about theatre in Bengal. Uh huh. Theatre in Bengal traces its origin to the Jatra. The Jatra, literally, literally, the word means the journey and can be traced back to the rise of Vaishnavism. Vaishnavism and the Bhakti cult, the Bhakti movement, especially was about Krishna, Krishnaism, in the 16th century, propelled by the advent of the mystique Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was a mystique saint who sang and danced. And <coughs> somewhere we have the Greek connection because he brought in elements of the Greek minstrel, you know, telling stories of mythology, of humanism, of uh, reality, of life and reality, and bringing people together in complete harmony. The Krishna Jatra evolved through the devotional singing and dancing of the followers of the Krishna Bhakti movement, inspired by Raslila and dramatic poetry. Raslila again was of love and longing and dancing and singing together from in love and spring between Krishna and all his gopikas. Like the Geet Govinda, which was a prominent literature, this time composed by Jayadeva, in the 12th century, and the Sri Krishna Kirtan, written by Chandidas, Chandidas in the 15th century. Chandidas, I would like to say, once he had said a particular sentence, Shobar upore manushotto, tahar upore nai, which means humanism is the greatest religion of all. There can be nothing beyond, nothing above. And that has always been a gospel for me when I compose my dance structures, my choreography, or my storytelling. And that's something with her also that has evolved with work. Historians also so mention. Perhaps when hmm. you end with Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. you relate that how Chandidas is also absolutely, the Bhagavad absolutely, Bhagavad. completely. That's something to say that you know that relates to say from the 15th century you are having some kind of an icon which people have forgotten. You know, yeah, you yeah, totally. Focus on the 19th century, 20th century mm -hmm, humanism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but humanism actually evolves a lot earlier. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, during a very very strong Muslim period. Absolutely, as well. so, you absolutely. Know, it's to see how these syncretic cults mm -hmm. are actually evolving at a time when um, one can talk of religious oppression in a different way. And, and these are very interesting ideas. Amalgamated in this common flow of humanism. There was no difference to it. Historians also mention the existence of Nata Gita. It's an operatic folk drama, which is a very important part of medieval drama in Bengal. It was filled with dancing and singing and music without dialogue and provided an early model for Krishna Jatra. There were no theater houses in Bengal and the Bengali Jatra evolved its idiom in actual journeys or religious processions you know, of devotees that moved from one place to another singing and dancing in the tunes of religious songs, often amongst them, artists adept in singing, dancing and enacting scenes from mythology. Specific influences on Bengali theatre as it evolved through the ages, apart from the Bhakti movement, were all the prevalent folk traditions of music, dance and singing of the region. It could be Jhumur, Gambhira, Gajangan or Pachali. These, are, these were all musical, lyrical storytelling with a 
huge overtone of humanism. And it created a new template for folk and contemporary theater in the coming centuries. Gradually, these small plays started being performed at the end of processions or just in open areas. But uh, open yeah, I areas. Think, I think arena is a, is, a, is a good word here. Yeah. It's used as well. You're reading Ashur. areas. Ashur. No, you said areas. But it's areas, 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 yes. You're written arenas. Arenas, yes. So, you know, it, it also has a Greek influence. Yeah, Greek standing. influence and an open kind of a miniature yeah. amphitheater to be created anywhere, you know, with just one or two levels and people sitting all, all around. More like an Ashur. Yeah. And it was a little Ashur in Bengali where it, it's like generic storytelling, you know, in various uh, colors and contexts and people sitting all around to create that interaction. And again, I want to bring in Soas here mm. because when I planned mm. the, the event, that is exactly what I had in mind, that it doesn't have to be a very structured talk. People can just be anywhere. So, you know, the, the Paul Webley wing allows you to do that, mm -hmm. where people are just scattered everywhere around you, and you'll have people talking, but not everyone is sat there. It's kind of an experiment with space, slightly, yeah. where your audience is almost like a big, large ashur. Mm -hmm. And often people will float in and say, oh, I heard you say that, or I heard you say, mm -hmm. or I heard you announce that. Why did you do that? So you kind of think, but you were not face to face with me, mm -hmm. but you heard it. So, you know, even pillars have the capacity to, to send sound. You kind mm -hmm. of think, am I recreating a temple here? Then? Totally, totally. Because in Indian temples, you often hear sound through yeah. pillars. That's always there, the singing pillars. Absolutely. So it's, it's kind Absolutely. Of, you know, that kind of space is, is a very interesting space in Indian theater mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. yeah, and it, it's for me, it's the most romantic setup that you can have because all the people are gathered and we might leave without knowing each other's names, but we have connected with the common thought, common philosophy and, a, and I think a common song in our hearts. And I think that's a very precious moment in human history whenever, even if you go to the Woodstock Festival, for example, or uh, the Prayag, the any concert or the Prayaga, you know, where you dip yourself into the Ganges and you don't know each other, but it's what a romantic, uh, unstructured choreography, I think. It's just everybody coming together. And the Jatra movement eventually moved to the urban regions, you know, and uh, brought literary works to be kind of spoken about, to be predominantly illiterate rural masses also became aware of the story, of the theme, of the moral issues that there were. Another development that occurred in the 19th century was departure from the Krishna Jatra and into a different format of musical where dance, poetry, lyrics, free verse, free speech soon kind of made, got into the traditional theater format and the Notun Jatra was created, the new theater. The other new trend in Jatra during this period was introduction of secular themes. As before this, it was traditional or very religious theater. But as people started asking more questions and the Renaissance had arrived, so people had op more open minds. They had the spirit of inquiry from the West. And so we went on to much more secular themes. In the early 20th century, at the onset of Indian independence movement, Jatra, which had already experienced its artistic and popularity peak in the previous century, evolved yet again with the changing tide of Indian milieu. It took on political themes and became a vehicle of political satire and protest and was called Swadeshi Jatra. Swadeshi means national and Jatra, here is, th th uh, Jatra means journey but it also meant theater in Bengal, which moved. A moving storytelling with a lot of drama, poetry and music. Bengal witnessed what was termed even in its own time as a renaissance between 1795 and the last quarter of the 19th century. So I just want to stop you 
Exactly. I knew exactly. And I said, Dr. Ghosh, you'll have to contribute here because it's and your voice. Sort of stop you because Absolutely. you kind of associate the Renaissance with mm -hmm. certain figures in history. Mm -hmm. And throughout the journey in this presentation, we are we are seeing these kind of established ideas have their own ruptures. And it's interesting that you talk of the early, the late 18th century, uh, a term, a Renaissance term is kind of, uh, you know, uh, used perhaps in relation to theater and, and quite rightly so, uh, before we actually connect the term Renaissance with English education and its you know, the absolutely, and absolutely. Kind of figures. So I think it's quite interesting to look at the mm -hmm. concept mm -hmm. from around this period in relation to how culture is actually shifting with the people, with folk elements in it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about European influence, mm -hmm. but you have your own little renaissance mm -hmm. going on here. Do you have any, um, uh, any even word? Uh, <coughs> For Renaissance? Um, I'm not, I'm not aware. I'm not no. aware around this time, but it's mm -hmm. an interesting question and perhaps there's mm -hmm. something there. There isn't anything I don't I'm not, I'm not, not, uh, I'm not quite sure around this time, but we can check that. Yeah. Maybe there are some, uh, some words. The, the thing is, there are many words. Otto, yeah, Jago, I mean, Jagoron. I mean, the, you know, uh, yeah. Late 18th century, a uh -huh. text or something mm -hmm. that can just back this up would be good to perhaps look at it, mm -hmm. but I'm not mm -hmm. sure yet. Something that is more easily available in the writings of mm -hmm. Ramon or, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, Ramon comes and then the word is there. It's mm -hmm. there for every historian, mm -hmm. but you don't see a 1795, the term used. No, exactly. And so, um, yeah, if you can go And on. also, also, I think Bengali authors use the word renaissance a lot, a lot, like Jege Otha and things like that, you know, which was, so it became very mundane. It wasn't given a specific term because they felt that it was their lifeblood. I know. But obviously there's a significant shift. Of course, of course. Feeling of thinking around this mm. time, which kind of makes you feel you could use this word mm -hmm. to justify certain trends and perhaps mm. one is certainly not to be known is. Uh, an example you're giving here. Hmm. So if you go on to that bit, the, the response of the Bengalis to Western culture. The Bengali Renaissance was a lot of cleverness and quite a bit of chaos because they didn't exactly know how to deal with British culture. So they put a fusion of British culture and then their native culture together because they were awestruck definitely with the British culture, with their spirit of inquiry and their more than rich native heritage. So this enormously enthusiastic response of the Bengalis to Western cultures and its tenets imposed by the British was much easier for them to adjust than to cope with colonial administration. It was a search for cultural identity that could at some level set them at par with the European overlords. It was an attempt to beat their masters at their own game it was a quest for an Indian cultural idiom that would more than cover the ignominy of being ruled and exploited by a foreign power. But in all the satirical prose that they evolved about the British, a lot of admiration also crept in. It is in the wake of this method to find a region, a respectful self-identity in the 1850s that several theatres just took shape in Kolkata. The Sepoy Mutiny in 1857 was also an important year in the context of Indian history. And this got reflected in many of the plays that were staged because you had multiple plays about the Sepoy mutiny about uh, particular British find, soldiers. Have you seen these plays? I have seen a couple of jatras, yes, and they are very exciting. Though uh, you have kind of uh, the British accent mimicked by some rustics, it's funny, but their awareness of history is also there. And I think you know you're dealing with the subject. It may not be portrayed perfectly, but that mimicry could be anukaran. I mean, we find it funny because it's highly dramatized. 
but there is some mimesis in Anukaran in it. At least three new theatres had come into being in 1857. Ashutesh Dev's theatre, the Vidyut Sahini, Kali Prasanna Sinha and his Belgachya theatre, Raja Pratap Chandra Sinha all contributed to producing Bengali versions of Sanskrit plays. Ram, Ram Narayan Tarakratna translated Sanskrit language plays with Bhatta Narayana's Beni Sangaham for Vidyut Sini theatre. Kali Prashanna Singha translated Kalidasa's Vikram Urvashi and, with, and it was about love and erotica and so uninhibited without the Victorian principles that at that time had been pushed into the Carnatic, the Deccan zone. So with these works, Bengali theatre directly connected with the pan-Indian Sanskrit dramatic materials and the tenets of the Natya Shastra. Dr. Ghosh. What would you like to say about Bengali theatre? Well, thank you very much for a, for a wonderful presentation. I mean, obviously the story goes on beyond mm -hmm. this because um, 1857 uh, is, a, is a very interesting political period mm -hmm. when um, you have, um, as, as she said, about you know, a lot of plays and theatres mm -hmm. revolving around the mutiny and the, polit the politics of it. But I myself have actually worked you were, after that. Um, from 1860 onwards is where I've worked till the 1878, um, where you have a series of peasant rebellions mm -hmm. that happen, and um, you have the Neil Darpan, there's the mm -hmm. famous uh, the Blue Mutiny uh, around Indigo Uprising, mm -hmm. followed by a series of plays which kind of are structured um, like Neil Darpan. And then you have the 1876 is when the Dramatic Performance Act mm -hmm. comes in, and you have a series of other plays that were targeted specifically because they were reflecting the sociopolitical uh, aspects of, um, of rule, and therefore they, many of them were censored. But these are all different uh, stories that have a different history, and we can go on and on, and there's quite a bit of work that's already been now coming out and doing it. It's still, it's, it's kind of under-researched area uh, of historical uh, writing still, I would say. Um, but to look at the previous period, 18, uh, b before 1857, before the, uh, the British uh, rule and these kind of political plays, you, you have got a good sort of corpus of how religion is being treated and how you know there are experiments with social drama as well that mixes with a lot of religious influences and and to look at those various centuries we have a we have a bit of a broad sweep here but that's what you can at the most do in an hour's talk but it gives you a sense of how fusions are happening and how you cannot actually slot things and say this is the purest version of say the Durga and then the mm -hmm. story of the Durga totally. travels in a different way. There's a Sufi influence that mm -hmm. is that creeps into um, theater writing and theater reception. The idea of the Jatra opens up again uh, that a, a lot of it is just not experimented by the writer but it's a traveling theater. So people are also getting inducted and their ideas are forming. And so it looks at the evolution of the history of theater uh, in a way that um, you cannot just say one influence works on one and then another thing influences another. So it kind of complicates the matrix of mm -hmm, influence mm -hmm. as well. Okay. I think this is where we wanted to sort of sum up slightly. Mm -hmm. But if you have any questions, then please do this instead of... This is amazing, actually. I wanted to ask about this uh, yeah, sure. picture. What does this picture say? So where is it? This one, the last page. Uh. This is a theatrical, it's one of those pictures which, which uh, is about one of the structured theatres in this oh, time. Sure. It's probably a show. show yeah, time. it's the post-show yeah. or the pre-show, yes. Yeah. Is it a historical evidence or where did you get this from? Yeah, I mean, the archives taken, yes. From the archives. Mm -hmm. yeah. so are it, 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 you, these are very mm -hmm. rare, mm -hmm. rare pictures actually mm -hmm. to, to actually yeah. collect yeah. because 
Um, <clears throat> I mean, you, you do know that the theatre history is not very well documented. That's another downside of actually okay. researching theatre is, 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 a, is a one hell of a job. Yes, that I can it take. Means in, in, uh, in it's just to look at the text. It's to look at the journey of the text. It's to look at, you know, who's performed what, and then to go in and so find the you know, No, not just Bengal. I would say the whole of India. You mm -hmm. know, to look at the theatre history um, during this period, I think there is there's a lot of problem with how we have preserved things yes. and how we've actually maintained things. I think the archival sources are mm -hmm. quite yeah. difficult to, mm. to, to locate. Um, I can talk a little bit about my own experience that, you know, it, it was almost like finding gold mine when I found this particular file in the National Archives, mm -hmm. which gave me the versions of one theatre, three versions of one particular theatre. I'm not going to say more because I'm going to publish this, mm -hmm. um, where I could actually see the script. And I could also see the lines and the, uh, the expressions that are cut out in the next version. Mm -hmm because the audience have said something or it had a repercussion. Now to actually find these kind of sources right. that are controlled as well, that would have been, uh, that would have come under sedition, is, is not something you get because those things are not easily documented like you would find it here. Yeah. I mean here the, the, the theatre history is well kept, it's documented, it's got different archives and you can find sources. Perhaps not as difficult as we would. So to, to to look at this kind of, you know, woman in this kind of clothing and performing is, is not something you will easily possibly find. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's probably one of the shows that you've probably picked up. And to me, it looks more like um, a kind of religio-political drama that is kind of mm -hmm. unfolding yeah. here. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, you can look at the more kind of regal dresses mm -hmm. that um, that figure as also well. Also, I can see some kind of um, makeup. Yeah. Like, and yes. I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. White mm -hmm. makeup mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the eyes and everything too. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Actually. You know, a long time ago, I was studying uh, geometry, mathematics, right? And uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly true, that's what I found. Because um, Greeks used to use uh, geometry not to use uh, knowns to derive the unknown. The Indians were already using algebra, mm -hmm. right? Um, basic algebra, you know, using Sanskrit uh, alphabet. But Indian, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Greek al alphabet. Uh, and we used an algebraic, sorry, uh, algebra. Expression mm -hmm. uh, to use uh, known to arrive at unknown. Right? What I found, what the Muslim did, they put together Greek geometry and Indian uh, algebra mm -hmm. together, and you know, like the same problem that you can use geometry you know, to uh, work out. You use algebra. To Mm -hmm. and they just put it together. Right? That's called like Muslim algebra. Mm -hmm. And then they incorporated the Indian numerical system, with the base 10, number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Because before that, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, they used to use base 16. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So there is like a um, lot of uh, influence. Absolutely, absolutely. They had maritime influence throughout. So we don't know. We all like to think that we gave it to the world. <laughs> Yes, That's, but no, it's, it's more kind of a narrow. Yeah, narrow they're all connected. Yeah. They're all connected. Yeah. But it's difficult to find the connections. You yeah. see, that's the thing. I mean, you can say, oh, we haven't taken it from you, but it's, it's also about how you look at the connections. Mm -hmm. And I think this paper shows that your connections could be quite layered and it doesn't exactly. flow from east to west or west to east. Mm -hmm. But it's also about 
the various junctures you could find. What about the idea? What about the idea that originally the Indians came from near Greece? But that again is questionable because the real Indians are the Deccans. Dravidians were more, to, they say, I mean, when the Aryans came in from Central Asia, the less, native less Indians, less infiltrated, yeah, they were pushed more towards south of India. So the Deccan is the original Indians, the Dravidians were actually the Indians. The Aryans came from Central Asia and then there was complete fusion. So one doesn't know. It's because of the mountain ranges mm. that is yeah. kind of traditionally thought as you couldn't actually penetrate there. And mm. the, the more kind of purest idea of mm. who the Indian would be is more towards the south rather than uh, Absolutely. the north. Um, I mean, that's the traditional historical piece. Yeah, yeah. The research so, something else, yeah, yeah, totally. Because you also have the maritime influences mm. from the south. So you don't quite know mm -hmm. whether there should be any kind of pure Indian there. Mm. You also have the maritime influences from the from the southern part of the country mm. where a lot of other things are going on there as well. I think it's all very mixed up. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's this idea of the Aryan, the non-Aryan, the Dravidian, kind of anthropological you know, the views, but those are shifting now. You know, Ramila Kapoor. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, absolutely. I spoke to her. She said there was no Aryan invasion of India. That's her perspective. That's her perception. He said, I, I he have, said yeah. there was movement slowly over thousands of years. So. Mm -hmm. There wasn't like a like a British invasion. There was mm -hmm. no Aryan invasion like that. It's she probably so thinks it's all kind of it's not an invasion. It's mm -hmm. more like a slow population. migration. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I think that there's a lot of historical evidence mm -hmm. for that. For that, that yes, suggests true. that this is kind of a, a slow process mm -hmm. rather than a one-off slaughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think uh, that's that's very true. Actually. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen No, it's a fusion, absolutely, because they say that the current uh, Irishmen uh, have ancestors in Iran. Yeah. Should we just stop it and then we continue in four minutes?